Who's got a question? I got one. Uh, you were going through the... You're guessing on nine. Wait, nine works as this. Nine in the Bible, and sometimes you buy a book of numerology, uh, you'll find these numbers defined. They're not always defined correctly. Uh, for example, I always say ten is the number of completeness, and it's not. It's a Gentile number. And I'll say five is the number of grace, and it isn't. It's the number of death. A good number for Hitler, five, five, five. And the offer for incense, uh, offering is five by five, where they offer kill him, lamb every morning, every night. The fifth month in the year is May, so when you crash, it's May Day, so forth and so on. So five is death. Now nine is fruitfulness. The way that thing works is uh, the longest, the gestation period for birth is nine months. And when uh, Noah is told, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth, it's Genesis 9. And when Sarah has that baby, she's 90, and he's 99. By the type of Christ. So that thing is, uh, that thing is fruitfulness. And if you get a nine, you've got to get something that's going to be bear, bear fruit. And whether this is right, I don't know or not. But it's a strange coincidence, but it's by coincidence. You have a book published in 1611. And six and three is nine. And it's called the King James Bible. And that's nine letters. And by pure quinky dinky, that's nine letters. So there are three nines right there. And uh, he says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not. Yeah. So it's probably that. All right, something else. Uh, Brother Ruckman, this isn't on something you talked about this morning, but I wondered if you might uh, share or f help us to know what the significance of uh, Revelation 2 7 and the church at Ephesus there, uh, which will be given the uh, chance to eat of the tree of the life, uh, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. I know that in Revelation 22 there, it's for the healing of the nations, and mm -hmm. I just wondered how that fit with the church. Oh, and uh, the answer to that thing is in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, you may have a picture of the church age, which we certainly do, but you get on the doctrine of the passage and you almost wind up in tribulation. The passage in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 that you cannot apply doctrine to the church in this age, and that's one of them. Uh, 2 7, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is the midst of the paradise of God. And there isn't any reason why that should be given to a Christian in this age. Because the tree of life is that they may eat and live forever. And the overcoming in that passage there has to do with works, because he says in Revelation uh, 22, 14, Bless they that keep his commandments, they may have a right to the tree of life, may enter in through the gates of the city. That could not apply to a Christian in the church age. Now there's several of them like that in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. Uh, for example, uh, take, take one here in... Uh, in uh, well, in chapter, in chapter 2, um, chapter 2, no, verse uh, uh, 11, uh, He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death, implying if you don't overcome, you will be hurt of the second death. And that isn't true of a Christian. Another one is chapter 3, verse 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Which would imply that if you did not overcome, your name would be blotted out of the book of life. And that isn't going to work anymore either. I'll show you another one, chapter 3, verse 12. Uh, chapter 3, verse 12. Him that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall no more go out. But I write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God. There isn't any temple in eternity in Jerusalem. Come to Revelation chapter uh, 21. And in 21, look at uh, verse uh, 22. There's no temple in Jerusalem. Uh, 2.22, I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. So the only answer to that thing is that when you get to Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, you must be dealing there doctrinally with 
stuff aimed at local churches in the tribulation. And still a picture of the church egg, and you can still use it for inspiration. Uh, inspirationally, it can, uh, you can apply those messages there to the local churches and get devotional material from them. But when you get the doctrine, then you're on something else. Now, that's all I, only way I can answer that question for you. Say the doctrinal application of those passages would be primarily to the tribulation. Uh, the books that have that kind of application in them are Hebrews to Revelation. And although in those books you can find verses aimed at Christians in the, this age, and the verses in there, the primary application of those verses is tribulation. Now, when you see that, it leans toward hyper-dispensationalism, but it's not. Because any one of those verses can be used for reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness in this age. And that is no, many times in those passages, there are passages that deal directly with the church. For example, in Revelation chapter uh, 19, uh, the Lamb's wife had made herself ready. That's the bride of Christ. That is the church. So you can't exclude the book. A hyper dispensationalist would draw a cut right there and say the Pauline epistles are for the church and these are for the tribulation. But that isn't true. There's a passage in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, Hebrew that says he made one sacrifice forever for sins and perfect remnant sanctified by one sacrifice for sins forever. That's for the body of Christ. There's a passage in First Peter that says you're redeemed with not the corruptible things such as silver and gold received by the vain conversation of your fathers, but by the precious blood of Christ, the lamb without a spot of blemish. That's for a Christian. Peter says being born again, not at sea. You can't just put a knife through there and say everything goes over here and everything goes over here. So there are passages in Revelation that apply to the church age. But if I was uh, taking that one doctrinally, I wouldn't apply that to the church age. Now, you can, you can do this. You can say, well, every Christian overcomes. You teach that and somebody says, what if I don't overcome, Brother Ruffin? The passage says, I'll have the second death. Well, I go to 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And who is he that overcome except he that believes in Jesus Christ, Son of God? So in 1 John 4, 4 and 1 John 5, 4, every Christian has already overcome. So he can claim all the promises. And But then technically if you applied the passage here where you asked about in 2, 7, the Christian uh, would have uh, I would, would have a right to, to eat of the tree of God. To him overcometh will I give eat of the tree of life. It means that if if that thing was all Christians are overcomers and that was a promise to a Christian, it means you could eat of the tree of life. But the question would come up then, what would you need to eat of it for? If for the healing of the nations and by the time the tree of life shows up, you will have been like Christ for a thousand years. You wouldn't need it. And if it's for eternal life, that won't work because you got eternal life from Jesus Christ. You don't get eternal life from a tree of life. So for that reason, I'd say doctrinally the application goes in the tribulation. All right, something else. Yes, sir. Preacher, in uh, the church being the bride of Christ, uh -huh. the church being the bride of Christ, which I believe it is, we go to Revelation 21 when John saw was taken up. And uh, there came, uh, verse 9, there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Now that's speaking of the city as to its inhabitants. Is that right? Like we would speak of the... Oh, uh, it must be the, the city as the place for the bride of Christ. Otherwise, it wouldn't be called the Lamb's wife. Thank you, sir. Uh, the Lamb's wife is said to be there a city, verse 10. So it must refer to who's going to be in that city. Otherwise, he couldn't like it to a city. And the, uh, there's a parallel of that. The devil has a city, and his city is Babylon. Therefore, you can say Babylon is the devil's wife. So he says in Revelation 17, the woman was on. She was riding the beast. It's a... It's a they call it bestiality in the sex perversion. It's the woman and the, and the beast together. 
in a relationship. And so because of that, you have King Kong and the girl and Dracula and the girl and Frankenstein and the Bride of Frankenstein and the mummy after the woman and the werewolf after the woman. You have the, that thing there. So the devil has a bride and she's a city and Christ has a bride and she's a city. But we wouldn't be doing harm to the scripture if we said it's the people of the cities, much like we'd say the uh, city of Lansing turned yeah, down Proposal F at the last election. No, well, it wasn't the bricks and mortar that, that voted, it was be, the that people. That wouldn't be stretching it because it's for the people that are going to be there, it will be the bride. Yes, sir. Okay. So that wouldn't be any Thank misuse you. of the scripture. Thank you. I'm behind you. Can you briefly explain uh, the gap theory or what you think of it between All right. Genesis 1, 1, 1? I'll get Second Peter chapter 3 in one hand and then get uh, Genesis chapter 1 in the other. And the thing in this matter here is it's not a gap theory. They call it a gap theory, but the people call it a gap theory the people who give uh, some credence to the people who don't believe what they read. And I'm not going to give them any credibility. Uh, it has never been a theory. It ain't even, even close to a theory. All right, Second Peter chapter 3 in one hand, Genesis 1 in the other. Now the problem comes in here is that somebody found a passage in Jeremiah that matched Genesis. And they found the thing in Jeremiah, they got, uh, got all messed up and tried to make it look like when God made the thing, he just made it form without form and void, and then later on kind of fixed it up. But here's the text, Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. What the, to make it a theory, you'd say this. The two schools of belief. One believes that when God made it in the beginning, he made it without form and void. And then later, verse 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, fixed it up. And the other theory is he created it, verse 1, period, and then something went wrong with it, verse 2, and then he recreated it, verse 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. That's called the gap theory, the idea there's a gap between verse 1 and verse 3. And uh, the thing is show that it's not a gap is these the words which aren't discussed, and here they are that are discussed. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of what? The waters. What are the waters doing there? All right, Second Peter chapter three shows what they're doing there. Second Peter chapter three. Second Peter chapter three, verse three. Knowing this first that there shall come in the last day scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? Now watch this. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Genesis one. Now that's called, uh, in geology, that's called uniformitarian geology, and it's the evolutionist geology. Uniformitarian teaches that, that all things continue as they always have been going along. Catastrophic geology says it started, something went wrong, it went along this way, bam, something else came in, it went along, bam, something else came in. And a, a Bible believer is a catastrophic geologist. We believe there have been two major interruptions in the progress of this earth. We believe there's one in Genesis 1, 2, and another one in Genesis 6 with Noah's flood. And that's catastrophic. Now your evolutionist is a uniformitarian. He says the way to judge the past is by the present. And the processes that are going on now went on then. And it's a slow, gradual process that's been going on ever since the world showed up that creates the stuff. And of course, that's like I said the other day, that's the mark of a mentally sick man. Matter of fact, most modern evolutionists now have given it up. When they got studying GNA and RNA and genetic material and these ribosomes and chromosomes and all this polypeptide chain of amino acids and all this stuff that goes into in the genetic code, they suddenly realized they were at a dead end. And they could have saved themselves a hundred years of trouble by listening to an Austrian, some Austrians. This Austrian monk, his name was George Mendel. And George Mendel, way back in 1870, he got fooling around with genetics, and he said, you cannot go from one species to another. The genetic, all the genetic material, coded material, applies each species separately, and there's no way to cross them. 
And somebody says, what about when you get a thing like a mule? Then you come to a dead end, it can't reproduce. And Mendel conducted breeding experiments that prove that uh, that much of Hitler was right. <laughs> now, he may have been some wrong in some other places, but when it talks about the genetic and breeding, he got that right. Of course, he picked on the wrong race. If you're going to inferior race, don't pick a Jew. That's the wrong one to pick. <laughs> Amen. Pick another one. <laughs> anyway, this Austrian cooked these things here, and he, he bred all these plants and bred all these chickens and stuff and got them all bred and put down his stuff on them, and it's just scientific. He shows when you put a, a white rose and a red rose together, you get a certain amount of white rose and red roses when you cross them, and the, well, the, it's always the same, same proportion. Same way with uh, one kind of rooster, another kind of rooster. Now, if they'd listened to Mendel, they could have saved 90 years' investigation, but they wouldn't listen to him. They said, he's out, if we still think that this rock uh, turned into a pool of water, and this pool of water bred amoebas, and they split in two and became planaria, and they became paramecium, and these birds turned into jellyfish, and then they turned into fish, and their tails came off, all this stuff, which was nonsense. And then after nearly 100 years, after World War II, after Hitler showed up, they got back on the genetics. When they got back genetics, they found Mendel was right and Charlie Darwin was wrong. So then they said, well, no wonder we can't find this perfect string of fossils. No one of the sudden missing links. They didn't gradually come up. They made jumps. That's catastrophic. And so now your neo-Darwinists are saying that this monkey was a monkey for years and years, and then suddenly he became a man. See? And the reason why you can't find the missing links is because there was this great gap, this burst of something or other that came in there. Now that's dangerous thinking. Because if he suddenly made the gap, what got him across the gap? The green monkey? So if he was just an ape and suddenly became a man, you mix the genes. And who mixed the genes? Well, whoever makes the genes, you should worship them. Because they're responsible for you being a person instead of a monkey. So, if it was a 33-year-old male from outer space that did the job, Genesis chapter 6, then you should be worshiping angels. Colossians chapter 3. You can't beat the thing with a stick. So what they're doing in all the universities now, they're messing with the genetic code. They're fooling with it. And they're trying to get them lined up together to prove there's a succession. And the way they get you is they make a movie called uh, Star Wars. And here's a, a Sky, uh, Skywalker walking along like this. He's a man. And right behind him is a, is a half man, half animal. Tobacco Chewy, whatever his name is. He's going along like this. And then right behind him is a metal man. He's a robot. You see going down the chain. And then right behind him is a sure enough fire plug, this little slot machine running along behind this person. And what they're trying to tell you is that the, 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 orga the, the flowers and trees and, and, and uh, vegetation out there, organic, slowly uh, uh, turned into uh, metal, and the metal gradually evolved into animal, and the animal gradually evolved into men. But they can no longer say gradually evolved because the links aren't there. So somebody jumped it by fooling with the genetic code. And now what they're doing is fooling with the genetic code. Now that's called, if they ever do it, they've admitted the Christian is right, because the Christian said all along it has not been gradual. The Christian has said, it is not continued as it was from the beginning. The Christian has said it's been interrupted at least twice. All right, now watch this context. Verse 4, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old. When? Verse 4, the beginning of the creation. You're in Genesis 1, you're not dealing with Noah. You're in Genesis 1. The earth standing out of the water and in the water. And that's why you read in Genesis 1 too, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. It wasn't Noah. What these modern Christians have done, they've gone to Second Peter chapter 3 and said that's Noah. It can't possibly be Noah. It's from the beginning of the creation. Then there's a flood in there. 
Now there's further proof of that here in a minute that's, that's real strong. Now look at verse uh, look at verse five. The heavens and earth, the heavens were of old, the earth standing in and out of the water, whereby the world that then was. All right, in five and six, there's a heaven and earth that was. Verse seven. But the heavens and earth which are now, there's the second one. And the third one, verse 13, nevertheless we according to this promise look for a new heaven and a new earth. So only three of them. There is the heavens and earth that was, there are the heavens and earth that are, and the heavens and the earth that are going to be. Why well, this one here, the heavens and earth that are, when are they, when are they there? Why well, they're there in Genesis 1, verse 3 to 1993. That's the ones that are here now. Nothing happened to the heavens in the day of Noah. Nothing happened to the heavens. The heavens in the days of Noah, the heaven you've got over your head right now. The heavens and earth that were are Genesis 1, 1 to 2. The ones that are are here, and the ones that are going to be are sitting over here in Revelation chapter 21, a new heaven and a new earth. The only three of them. All right, then between here and between here, something went wrong. And whatever went wrong, it was water. Because the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. Now the proof of that lies in Scripture with Scripture in a way that, uh, that nobody can argue with if they keep the senses about them. And the way that thing works is you study Adam as a type of Noah. Would sound like a wild thing, but it isn't wild. Here's Adam, and here's Noah. Now, you know what the Lord says to Adam? He says, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. You know what he said to Noah? Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. It's an identical commission, but the same. But it doesn't end there. When that old boy sins, he's naked. When that old boy sins, he's naked. When that fellow sins, he sins by taking something orally. When that one sins, he takes something orally. But when that one sins, he has three sons. Uh, Seth, Cain, and Abel. And this one has three sons. Shem, Ham, Japheth. And this one here, one of his boys has a curse connected with him, and this here, one of his boys has a curse connected with him. And this one here, one of his boys a type of Christ, and that one, one of his boys a type of Christ. They're identical. So when he says to Noah, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth, then whatever happened before Noah had to happen before Adam. So when the Lord says to Noah, sitting over here, he says to Noah in uh, oh, Genesis, uh, Genesis 9, uh, 9 8, 8 and 9, be fruitful and multiply and punish the earth. He letting you know when before Noah was told that, there was a flood. So assure the world if God told Adam in Genesis chapter 2, be fruitful and multiply and punish the earth, before Adam there was a flood. They have to be. The things match all the way down. Which means that in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 and verse 3, God took the original creation and drowned it out. There have been two floods. There have been two floods. And the first one was by far the worst. And so you have this thing here where in Genesis 1 you have the original creation, then there's a flood. And up shows the next one here, Genesis 1, 3, and God remakes it, and there's a flood. And up shows Noah over here in Genesis chapter 8 and chapter 9, and this time the Lord says, I'm not going to let the flood of waters anymore destroy the earth. Next time it's going to be a fire. He did it twice with water. Once there and once there. So that idea about a gap theory is not a theory at all. That's one of the strongest uh, established facts in the scripture. The Lord drowned that thing out. All right, something else. Thank I followed uh, some of your uh, UFO literature for uh, several years, 
And I was wondering if you had read uh, this book by Whitley Strieber, Communion. Street call, what, a call, book called uh, what? Whitley Strieber wrote it. It's called Communion. No, I have. In, uh, in his book, he uh, was had close encounters of the third kind. And uh, in his book, he, 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 uh, on board, he says there's a female deity out there called the Queen of Heaven. Yeah. And he literally worships her in his book. And he's been on Larry King Live. It was the New York Times bestseller. And he said the key to understanding these people visiting us was to uh, embrace the Sphinx. To do what? Embrace the Sphinx that they, over in Egypt, the um, Sphinx. Sphinx. S Embrace the Sphinx. Right. Yeah, that's a check. <laughs> and anyway, it just it was amazing. I mean, he's promoting this nationally that we should allow these beings to come here and take over. Right. And anyway, I was just I can't remember where the Queen of Heaven is in Jeremiah forty four. Okay. I just it just blew my mind. You can read right. his book and you just put scripture right next to the Oh yeah. And, well, I get uh, Jeremiah 44, I'll show you this Queen of Heaven, and I'll show you what she's called in Judges. Get Jeremiah 44 in one hand, Judges 2 in the other. This idea of a female deity is as old as uh, Nimrod Babylon. And the original, the, original, uh, the original version of it is a black man with a blonde, with a blonde woman. So the news media and the press always have to take that picture, wherever they find it. And the, well, the father of the camera is told, every time you find a Negro with a, with a blonde woman, photograph it. You'll see it over and 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 over. It'll be on the, the uh, talk shows, it'll be in the night shows, it'll be in the Hollywood Award shows, the Grammy Award shows. It'll be on parades, it'll be in White House meetings, it'll be, you'll find the, the cameraman is told what to pick up. He's told to pick this blonde woman with this black man. All right, Judges chapter 2, and Judges chapter 2, uh, verse 13, uh, and Judges 2, 13, the Lord's angry with them, and he says this, They forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtoreth. Now, said Baal, that's a male god. Now, Ashtoreth, that's a female goddess. And she has a number of names, and sometimes it's spelled like this, instead of Ashtoreth. And sometimes like this. And sometimes like this. And sometimes like this. That name. And uh, in in the other in the other uh, in the other religion, she comes out like this. And this. And for the Germans. The Lorelei, and for the Scandinavians, the L woman, and uh, Minerva is another one. And that thing is found throughout throughout pagan literature and pagan mythology. And the Catholics call her Mary. And the the Jewish maid, the Jewish maiden that gave birth to Jesus Christ, is not one of those things, but they converted her into one of those things. And I'll tell you at the judgment, Mary's going to have something to say to your Roman Catholic mamas and daddies. Amen. I'll kid you not. Uh, you talk about resentment, boy, using her name as an alibi for blasphemy and idolatry. Mary's going to rise up in the judgment and have something to say, boy. Uh, Christ said the Queen of Sheba will rise up in judgment to condemn this generation. Well, Mary will rise up. And beside that, if she's going to be like Christ, she won't be a female anymore anyway. She'll be a 33-year-old angel. I'd be rough to get to heaven, look for Mary, and not find her. Say, <laughs> so where's Mary? And an angel come down and say, I'm Mary. Who do you think I was? <laughs> you know, <laughs> <You're> rough. <laughs> you realize, you realize that if you make Mary the Queen of Heaven and say she can hear prayers at one time, that she's omnipresent. I mean, if four hundred thousand Catholics are praying to her in the Philippines, and four hundred thousand in Spain, five hundred thousand in America, and twenty thousand in Italy at the same time, she has to be omnipresent. She has to be God. People don't think about that. They say, just honor her like you do your mother. Well, your mother can't hear 400 million people praying at the same time. They've given her attribute of deity. Oh, now that thing there is a, is a female goddess. 
And the whole Hillary, Sarah Brady, Janet Reno, women lib movement is to make a goddess out of women. Not the humanist to materialize that stuff in it. Every woman should find the goddess in her. You know, that stuff. That's all in there. But that stuff is paganism. Now, when you couple that with Baal, then you get two and two. And two and two, as I said tonight, is four. It isn't six. And when you couple the female with the male, only one thing can happen. And when you get a this female goddess, you give her a sign. She's a moon. And you give him a sign. He's the sun. You get a sun god and a moon goddess. And you get them together, they got to have children. Well, if that is the male god, that's the female goddess, and this one here runs of all kinds of names. This here is Jupiter. This here is Zeus. And there's Isis and uh, Osiris, the male and female, and all those. So all those pagan religions have, they got a great bond of affinity. And the bond of affinity they have is that sex becomes part of the worship service. Because the worship service is worshiping uh, male and female. Now the Lord in uh, Christianity uh, saved you from that. And he made God the Father male. And God the Son male. And God the Holy Spirit male. So you couldn't get any sex going in there. Unless you were a homo. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing he did, when, he, when Christ was born, the Holy Spirit came down and planted the seed in the Virgin Mary, and she begat Christ, who is God. So the Catholics say that Mary is the mother of God. You see how subtle this stuff is? Uh, Mary didn't give birth to God, she gave birth to Jesus Christ. But isn't Jesus Christ God? Yes, then Mary is the mother of God. No. Christ has two natures. Mary is not the mother of one of those natures. She's mother of the nature, the son of man. The man, Jesus is a man in name, but not the divine nature. The divine nature is from God himself. God might have, see, but, but see how the thing goes? All right, now here's, it gets more complicated by the minute. It gets into incest. If God came to Mary and gave birth to God, then the son, see, <laughs> could have checked with his mother. So they have a term for that the black people use, that you hear on television in the sports fields. And Paul warns about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, chapter 5. Now the idea is if Christ is God and gave birth to himself to his mother, then Christ the Son had relationship with the mother. Now that sounds to you like terrible, horrible stuff, but you have to grow up sometime and realize this world is a wicked place. It always has been a wicked place. It always will be a wicked place. And this stuff has been carrying on day and night among educated people for six millenniums. And as a consequence, now all these characters here have a relationship with the Son. Now the one in the Bible that you're warned against is Baal and Ashtoreth. And between them, they have a son, and this son is called Thomas. And you'll find that thing mentioned in, the, in Ezekiel. All right, in the original, in the original, Nimrod, he's an African, he's from Ham, has a wife, Asherah, and have a son, Thomas. So he comes out as a type of God to be worshipped. She turns out to be a type of Mary, the given birth to the Savior, Thomas. And Ezekiel, the men and women at the tabernacle are weeping for Thomas, because Thomas died. In Greek, it's Apollos who dies. And he's down in the underworld waiting to come up. So when you send up the first rocket, you call it Apollos. Now all this stuff here is in found in the book called The Two Babylon by Hislop. And the long and short of it is all pagan worship is built around sun worship. S-U-N, because it's the source of all the life. But by making the sun a male, the moon female, you get a sex element there where sex becomes part of the worship service where you, <coughs> quote, reverence life. Because man is the <coughs> measure of all things, you see. And the first thing you know, the, 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 the physical part becomes the main part. 
In the Catholic Church, you take the old priest and put him in one place, put a wedding ring on his hand, because he's married to Mary. So he's a virgin, but he's married. <laughs> and you put a nun over here and put a ring in her hand, she's married to Christ. And she's a virgin, so she's married. <laughs> and two and two <laughs> is four. <laughs> and where it doesn't come out four, they start molesting kids, as you probably know. Now on this thing here, you have this principle there, a male principle and a female principle. And the female there is, uh, uh, they get together and they get this son, this son's a savior. So you have this kind of a thing where if you had a pagan trinity, uh, the first member of the trinity would be the father. And the second member of the trinity would be Mary. And the third member of the trinity would be Jesus Christ. If you were a pagan... And at the Council of Nicaea, the bunch of bishops that showed up there from Africa that thought that Mary was the second person in the Trinity. And as far as the Catholic is concerned, she might as well be, because she was born sinless, immaculate conception, like Christ. And she came up from the dead ahead of time, bodily assumption, like Christ. And she's omnipresent, like Christ. So although you're a good, sweet Catholic grandmother and grandfather, and you find Catholic cousins are just wonderful people, and some of them are, spiritually they're just as full of the devil as the devil. They've made a goddess out of a sinner. And on this thing here, when the woman shows up, she's a goddess, so if she's a goddess and she connected with the sun, sun god, worship the sun, she has to kind of shine. So gentlemen prefer blondes, you see. And if the idea is that this light that comes out from this peroxide here, <laughs> and it comes out and it makes what they call a nimbus, or halo. It's an electronic force field that comes out around the thing, and that's why it connects with the UFO. Now the UFO comes down, it looks like this. And the old Catholic priest, when he gets his circular tonsure, he looks like this. And then his color goes like that. When he puts the wafer in your mouth, it goes like this. And you step in the Catholic church, the first thing you see is a big gold disc down at the front of the altar. It's sun worship. It's the original Baal worship. That's what that thing is. All the pictures of Mary at the time of Raphael were painted with yellow hair. Now after Raphael goes in the brown hair, of course, if she's a Jewess, it'll be black hair, it won't be blonde hair. Well, that's what's involved in this Queen of Heaven stuff, you see. And that's why the saint is painted with this UFO around his head. And uh, where it really gets thick is where some little boys and girls in Portugal see this UFO and say it's Mary, and Mary talked to us. And maybe Mary did talk to him, but it wasn't the Mary of the Bible. <laughs> Is that Mary there? Mary, Mary, quite contrary. <laughs> All right, Jeremiah 44, Jeremiah 44, Jeremiah 44, verse 17. But we will certainly do whatever thing goes forth out of our own mouth to burn incense to the queen of heaven. Verse 18, since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven. Verse 19, we burn incense to the queen of heaven. That's why God drove the Jews out. Jeremiah 44, look at verse 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. He drove them out for taking on the idolatry of sex practices of the Canaanites. So they worshipped a male-female deity, and sex was in their worship services. <clears throat> Whether you remember or not, but in First Kings, he said he drove out one place where the women wore hangings for the grove where the Sodomites were. So sodomy became part of the morning worship service. A sex act becomes deified in this system. Because in this system, you're worshiping the basic male-female element. Uh, I'll show you one case for sure. Come to, come to Revelation chapter uh, 3. And look right in the middle of the tribulation worship. 320. And the woman is there. She's involved. You've got a woman pastor. Hillary or Sarah or Janet or somebody. Revelation, Revelation, make it Revelation 2.20. Revelation 2.20. <coughs> Revelation 2.20. 
Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which called herself a prophetess, religious teacher, to teach and seduce my servants, one, to commit fornication, and two, to eat things sacrificed to idols. The sacrifice, the fornication, are part of the worship service. And come to Revelation chapter 14, and notice the people who don't partake in the worship service have to be virgins. Revelation 14, 4. Physically. Revelation 14, 4. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. There it goes. It couldn't be just unmarried men in that sense. So you're not defiled because you get married. Paul says marriage is honorable law. He's talking about not partaking in a, in a worship service where fornication is part of the service. Now that's the great new world you're headed for. What you're headed for is a situation where Sunday morning becomes a, uh, becomes a uh, tonight show with a rock band and strippers. That's where you're headed. What you need, what you need is for something to come down here on earth. All we're doing is waiting for the man. That's all we're doing. Of course, we're, we're waiting for another man. But I mean, they're, they're waiting for their man. We're waiting for ours. <laughs> uh, our man has already been here. See, it's going back. Their man hadn't showed up yet, but he'll show up. And what they're waiting for is a nice 33-year-old uh, electronic UFO fella step out here with a glow around him. Nice electronic glow. And say, I've come to bring you the truth. Once upon a time when you were just gorillas and chimpanzees and lemurs and tar seers and orangutans and monkeys, we came down and helped you get across the barrier. And the reason why you can think and talk today is because we got you across the evolutionary gap. And here's how to do it. And go to work on animals. And the first thing you know, you might have something coming out there that was half man, half goat. They're called satyrs in mythology. You might have one as part horse and part man. They're called centaurs in mythology. And the mythology ain't as mythological as it sounds. All you got to do is just mix up the genetic chain. You know what they're doing now at the University of Michigan? They're messing with the genetic chain. That's what they're doing. Haven't you got a university put in here someplace? Yeah, Michigan State. Where's that at? The boy Lansing? Uh-huh. You know what they're doing there? They're right on this line. Coming right. I know them. I know them educated people. They're in that lab working that genetic case. RNA, DNA, ribosomes, nucleic acids, po polypeptide chains of viable. Uh-huh. That's what they're doing. Okay. So much for horror stories. <laughs> In Acts 12, there, 12, 4, when, when Luke mentions Easter, he's actually talking about a pagan tradition. Right? Yes, he is. Because Passover, if it's the day of unleavened bread, isn't Passover essentially over? It has to be, because he says day is plural. It's already gone. It's not even the next day. And Acts chapter, what he's talking about is Acts chapter 12. The problem comes up, why is this word translated Easter in Acts chapter 12? And the word is uh, normally translated Passover. In Greek, it looks like this. It's uh, uh, Pascha, and that thing transliterated comes out P-A-S-C-H. It's a hard K-A, and from that the Passover lamb, that thing is translated. Now this time it's translated as Easter, and somebody said, well, that's the uh, wrong way to translate it. You can't, uh, you can't just say it's the wrong way to translate it. For example, in Martin Luther's Bible, that thing comes out Easter every time it shows up. Martin Luther highly like a shrift every time it says Passover, he says Easter. He didn't go further than that. When Luther comes to where it says, Christ our Passover lamb is sacrificed for us in 1 Corinthians, Luther will say, Christ our Easter lamb is sacrificed for us. Now that principle in translating is, called, is what we call dynamic equivalence. And there are two ways to translate. One is called formal correspondence, one is called dynamic equivalence. And when you pick up a new version, I'll tell you all you got. Any new version, all you've got is a, is a, is a version that is made to get rid of this Bible. Where they get rid of this Bible, they take every place in here where the fellow was corresponding formally and change it to an equivalent. And every place in here where we had an equivalent, he changes it back to formal. 
I know them birds. I know them like on the back of my hand. And all they're doing is when the King James translates the Greek word for word exactly the way it is, and often it does, they say, no, it's better to make it this, a dynamic equivalent. Well, the King James has a dynamic equivalent. Say like the thief on the cross said, he cast the same into his teeth. See, that isn't any Greek testament. That isn't any literal Greek. That's an expression. He cast the same in his teeth. They say, see there, they didn't follow the Greek. But they don't follow the Greek themselves, the other places. It's a, it's a double deal. All right, now here you have exact translation. Exact would be Passover. A dynamic equivalent would be Easter. And the question comes up, what should it be in this case? And the King James translators wisely translated the way they did for two reasons. Now here's the first one. Acts chapter 12, verse uh, 3. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Days. They had to eat unleavened bread seven days after the Passover. That's in Exodus chapter 12. When they went out of the land of Egypt, the first night of the Passover, they got rid of all the leavened bread, and you roast that lamb without leaven, make that bread without leaven, and then go without leaven for seven days. Now this thing says those were the days pearl of unleavened bread. So it's after the Passover. Then he says in verse 4, when he apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now if he'd writ written there intending after the Passover to bring him forth, he could have brought him forth right then. He was already after the Passover. That is, no, if he was going to wait till after the Passover, the next Passover wouldn't have been for another year. So they said Easter. Now for two reasons. First of all, because the Passover proper was already over. And secondly, because Herod is a Roman. And he would be observing Easter, which would not be the Passover. If you had the Passover there like they did on uh, Wednesday, uh, he's not waiting for Thursday or Friday. He's waiting uh, till after Sunday. Because, you see, he's a sun worshiper. Sunday. As in there. And so for him it's Easter. Now the question, when that first thing came out, John R. Rice, bless his heart, bless his memory, fine fellow, love the Lord, thank God for all that kind of thing. But when he tried to expound the Bible, he was just a blubbering idiot about half time he talked. As long as he talked about soul winning and compassion on folks and prayer, he did fine. He was a good man, God used him. When he tried to teach that Bible, he made the biggest mess you ever saw. He said, Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying the devil wouldn't kill him before he get to the cross. I mean, what a stupid thing to say. Why, the devil couldn't have killed Christ if he'd stayed up all night. Don't you know that? Oh, God, please don't let the devil kill me before I get to the cross. What a dumb thing. Why, well, he said, the prayer was answered. The prayer wasn't answered. Christ in Gethsemane said, Father, be a will, let this pass from me, this cup pass from me. And ten minutes later he said, uh, the cup my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? He did take the cup. If the cup was physical death, then he died before he got the cross. The cup the father gave me, I'm going to drink it. There's no reference to that at all. And when Rice got to this passage, he said, this word Easter is entirely out of place. Easter wasn't even known, uh, known about at that time. It was a Roman Catholic holiday that didn't show up two years later. Well, the old boy should have just, you know, stayed in the pulpit, not ever got back in the study. Easter is observed 2,000 years before Christ. And somebody said, well, it's a, yeah, the thing down there, it's a, it's a Babylonian type of thing. What would the Romans know about it? Well, the Babylonians are down in Edom, and that old Herod, look him up in Josephus Antiquities Encyclopedia, that old fellow Herod is an Edomite. He's not a Jew or a Roman, he's from Edom, that bird. That Herod in that passage is a half-breed Roman, and he's a half-breed Jew. Good type Antichrist. <laughs> and he's from Edom. You know, how, you know how far back in history the Babylonians were down in Edom? Turn to Genesis uh, 14. They're way down there before the birth of Isaac. And that's why those Jews are messing around with Ashtoreth worship and Baal worship in the book of Judges. It's been around for centuries. Genesis 14.1. It came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar. Do you know where Shinar is? 
All right, folks, how many of you know where the plain of Shinar is? What you've been reading, Reader's Digest? <laughs> it came to pass that they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they said, Go to, let us build a city and tower whose top may reach into heaven. And the Lord came down and saw the city of the Son of Men, tower of men and build, and said, If they do this, they won't do it, so forth and so on, let us confuse their language. Wherefore they left off building and called the name of that place Babel. Babel, that's Nimrod, king of Babylon, that's the plain of Shinar. The king of Shinar is it's in Babylonia. Where is he at? Verse 2 and verse 3. He's down there in the Dead Sea, the Salt Sea, fighting against Edomites down there south of the Dead Sea. That's where Edom is. He's down in there. And that bird is down there. That thing is Sodom and Gomorrah down in there. Verse 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Look at verse 10. The veil of Sidon was full of slime pits. The king of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's south of the Dead Sea. It's Edom where that thing is. That Babylonian, he's down there before the birth of Isaac. So that's why the Jews pick up that religion. So when the King James translators translated that thing as Easter, they gave you two pieces of light you wouldn't have had if they'd translated it the other way. First of all, they let you know that, that Herod, King Herod was a Roman, and the Romans observe Easter. They don't observe the Passover. And do you realize how enlightening that is? Because every Easter, you hold Easter on Sunday, and the Passover is not on Sunday. On a Jewish calendar, sometimes the Passover is Wednesday, sometimes it's Friday, sometimes it's Thursday. And the first big rupture in the church, in church history, between the Greek church and the Roman church, was the Greek church insisted on keeping the Jewish date for the Passover. And Rome said, Sunday, 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 Sun God. And they kept it there. So when the King James Translator did that, they gave you light, not otherwise you wouldn't have had. And secondly, they gave you light in the fact that Herod's intention was not to kill him right after the Passover, because he didn't. At least a day had gone by, because it said those are the days of unleavened bread. So in the King James Bible, you have a much better translation you do in the other Bibles. Better to keep it the way it is. All right, something else. I would like to know when Adam's son killed Abel and Cain went into the land of Nod. Was that in a flood before these people were? Or where did the wife come from that he married? All right. Uh, Genesis. And also then the men too. When they came off of the ark, where did they get people to marry again? All right. Genesis chapter 4. Here's Genesis chapter 4, and the problem here is where did Cain get his wife? Genesis chapter 4. If only Cain, only Cain and Abel and Adam and Eve were there. And of course the, 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 the answer of levity is he got her from his father-in-law. <laughs> but that isn't the right answer in the Bible, you know. Oh, now the, 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 thing, the thing depends upon when he killed Abel, like she asked. The, the question is when did he do that? Well, now look in Genesis chapter 4, and Genesis chapter 4, look at verse 16. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. That'd be Iraq and Iran, on a map. And Cain knew his wife. Now notice it doesn't say he found her. He knew her, it's a carnal relationship, she conceived. So it isn't, that, it isn't that Cain walked out here in the bushes and found this woman standing out here, off in the bushes someplace, and said, Mona, how are you, how are you? And then he didn't find her out there. That's the place where they had the child. Now, you don't know where he found her, but he had her evidently before he went. Now, in Genesis chapter 5, notice this thing here. Genesis 5, verse 1. There at the time that, that uh, Cain leaves out and goes over there to the land of Nod, there has to be at least uh, 2,000 people on this earth of some kind. Because if you, if, a thing you may not have noticed and which the, the critics didn't notice there was not only just a problem in where did Cain find his wife, here's the bigger problem, why did he build a city? That's the real problem. You back there in chapter 4, look at verse 7, he need to build a city. What you building a city for? Just you and your wife and a kid? See, that isn't going to work. All right, Genesis chapter 5, so there's somebody around. Now, the chance are 10 to 1, the sons of God are around. 
And the chances are they're around because when the devil speaks to Eve, he said, you should be as God as knowing good and evil, implying she knows something about the gods. And their passage in Genesis chapter 6 says, when the sons of, when the, uh, the sons of God saw the daughters of men, so they're around. But I don't believe he built a city for them. All right, Genesis 5, verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, and the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam in the day they were created. Notice, no Eve. Now, God didn't call her Eve. She didn't have any name. Adam called her Eve after they fell. He called her Eve because she was the mother of all living. Uh, God just called him Adam, which is why you ladies don't have any name. People say, well, men and women are equal. No way in the world. You couldn't possibly make them equal. You ladies say, what you, you want to all get over there and some men get over here and have a fight and see who wins? <laughs> and somebody says, well, it isn't like that. But what is it like? Who are the greatest cooks in the world, ladies? They're men. <laughs> you better believe it. You know who the greatest hairdressers and costume designers are? They're men. Really, ladies, you can't do much of anything right now. <laughs> Except you could do one thing that no man can do. You can bear life. You know why the men do all the things they do? They're, trying to, they're in competition with a woman. You know, I'm, an, I'm an artist, see? And I'm a musician and a writer. I'm all three of them. I've written 120 books. I play guitar, bass, fiddle, tuba, and uh, harmonica. And I've painted, I've painted, I don't, I couldn't even guess. 20,000 chalk talks, um, uh, 8,000 pen and ink sketches, 1,000 watercolors. I don't even know what it come to. But you see why men major in those things? Because they can't produce life. He called her name Eve because she was the mother of all living. So once you take the woman, try to make her a combat pilot, you know, an instrument, you just make a fool out of yourself because she's in a field where she can't really compete. Now, if she sticks to having children and raising children, there ain't a man in the world can come anywhere near her. A man can't have kids. But you start making her a combat pilot. Well, come on, come on. Suppose she can fly a plane and shoot a few bullets. You think she's going to go up and, and fight against Eric Hartman or, or Baron Richthofen? <laughs> that Eric Hartman shot down 316 planes, man. Twice as many as Richthofen shot down. They were all men. And you ladies like to go up and get fight, fight Eric? <laughs> the woman, she can get by, but she can't excel. She can excel when it comes to the children. That's where she excels. She can get by. Grandma Moses can paint. Okay? Uh, the world's smallest, smallest volume, great women symphony orchestra conductors. <laughs> the world's smallest volume, famous women classical composers. <laughs> One page or two. <laughs> you see, that isn't your field. And you get out of your field, then you're handicapped. And so uh, this idea, I, you know, see, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm macho. I mean, I'm chauvinist all the way, boy, all the way. I mean, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an artist and a musician. I know why men create and how they create. And uh, same way with the women. The women, the women, your, your strong suit is bearing life. And with a man, you can keep up if the government gives you special privileges and special grants. You can keep up with a man for a while. But you can't compete with him, no way in God's earth. Why, why don't you just, why don't they put all the women in, in one, in one division? You want to put them in the army? Put them in one division. How about that? Let's have all the blacks in one division, all the whites in one division, all the women in one division. What do you suppose happened in battle? <laughs> Can you guess? 2,000 women all division with women colonels and women majors and women lieutenants and women sergeants and women corporals and all the enlisted women, women. Let's go and fight the Turks. Yeah. <laughs> well, you have the whole, a whole bunch of them dead and raped in less than 24 hours. You can't compete with a man. Well, as I was saying, oh, you ladies don't have any name. Now, if you're unmarried, you have your father's name. Right? right. If you're married, you have your husband's name. Right? Yeah. You're nameless. <laughs> It isn't Adam and Eve, it's Mr. and Mrs. Adam. That's what it is. 
And how could you have a name anyway? You have no seed. Amen. Suppose you change your name, Bella An Ansuk, and you made up a name. You couldn't pass it on to anybody. You haven't got any seed. If you had a child, would you give the child the mother's name instead of the father's name? How, lo how long do you reckon that would last? Now, who is it, Hillary, that was using her maiden name? Was she the one doing that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what a lot of thing, man. Didn't do her any good. That's her father's name. You're still male. <laughs> you can't give it to the male. Now, you ladies were made for the male. Adam said, this is bone of my bones, male bone, flesh of my flesh, it's male flesh. You're part of the man. And that's why you have certain characters about you that just, you can't ever make them the same. For example, you ladies have a sense of cleanness and orderliness a man doesn't have. Now, I know there are women lushes and bimbos as sloppy as can be, and some women don't keep a house, and the house looks like a tornado hit it when you come. I know that. But any woman, if she's given a job to clean up a room and do a better, man, uh, a better job than a man will, because a woman has a natural sense of cleanliness a man doesn't have. You say, why is it? Because the man is made out of the dirt. <laughs> and you women are not made out of the dirt. You're made out of the bone. <laughs> Now, you take the last thing this earth I'd ever want to get into is, a, is an infantry company full of women. A woman was never made to call around on her belly in the mud. I remember, uh, I remember the first time, I'll get back to this in a minute, but I remember the first time I felt sorry for a woman. And I think I was 24 years old at the time. And the first time it ever even occurred to me, you know, they ought to have any sympathy. Uh, my mother's a chronic alcoholic. I learned how to drink from her and learned how to gamble from her. She played poker. I couldn't sing the first song I heard her sing when I was four years old. I remember all the words in it. And when I came up, I came in the, up in the street. I'd come home for dinner, and that'd be about it. And my my dealing with women those days was like I'd be down in New Orleans in the French Quarter when I was about 16, selling pictures down there in Pirate's Alley and playing drums down there in the dance band. And I'd come by a bar and see a woman pass out and fall off a bar stool and hit the ground. Some guy lean over and start to pick her up. The guy next to him say, don't ever pick up a woman she's down, buddy, kick her. <laughs> that kind of thing. It's kind of a rough bring it up. And I'll never forget one time I was in a plane flying from uh, Manila to, to Tokyo. And we left at night about 2 o'clock in the morning and about 5.30 and the sun began to come up. I woke up in that plane, didn't have any seats. It was an old flying box car with all the seats taken out, even the benches the trooper sat on. You just lie around a hull, you know, on the floor. And I woke up in that thing, and there were two whacks on that plane. That's the first time women waves and wax, they call them back in World War II. And those two wa waves were in there, wax, they're wax. Must have been about 20, 21, 22 were in there. And about eight or nine men there, you know, and a couple of blacks lying around the floor and dust inside the plane. And I remember getting up and looking at those girls, and they got up there with those wrinkled clothes and the hair all messed up, no makeup on, no way to take a bath or a shower. And they got up there and tried to straighten out their slacks, you know, and one of them tried to fix up her hair, you know, and thought occurred to me, my God, what a way for a woman to live. What is a woman doing a thing like this? What do a woman do an empty plane with no seats in it, banging around with a metal frame, trying to get a makeup kit out? and fix herself up at 6 o'clock. She got no business here. I haven't changed my mind about that a bit. I don't think you have any business being there at all. All right, uh, verse uh, 3. And Adam lived 130 years and began to son his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. All right, here's Adam. From 1 to 130. And 130, Seth is born, indicating that Adam is killed sometime in 129. That is, Cain kills Abel sometime around that time, 129 years, coming up through there. And 129 years uh, with uh, things the way they were, that gives Adam time to give birth to how many children? I know fellows down south that are 90 and 100 years old, and they have uh, 60 and 75 descendants. He's got more than that. And depending upon when Cain got his wife, even if he had her then and went out with her, which he may have done, undoubtedly he had at least uh, 40 women to pick from. 
Now, he might not have married them. He might have gone out, and no time element is given, he might have gone out and then, at that time, began to build the city, and at this time, knew his wife. You're not given the time there. Now, the question comes up, if there weren't several thousand people around to pick from, and of course, if he didn't, if he didn't get married until, uh, until Adam was 300 years old, he'd have certainly had at least 5,000 people to pick from. At least 5,000. I mean, that's a long time. Here's uh, 1776 and 1976. All right, 20, 200 years. All right, let's take, let's, let's do this. In 1492, how many Europeans were in America? Okay, we'll take 1792, how many were in America? That's 300 years. Um, you get a pretty good populace in that time. Now, in, in Cain's case, if he waited till something like 150 years after he killed Abel, he'd had three or 4,000 women to choose from, but suppose, suppose all he had to choose from were three sisters. Look at, uh, look at verse, uh, uh, look at verse 4. The days of Adam after he begotten Seth 300 years, and he begat sons and daughters. See that? So he could have married a sister. And somebody said that would have been wrong. Well, Abraham married a sister. She wasn't a sister by both his parents, but by one of his parents, and God never said nothing about that. And the case of Adam and Eve's time, it wouldn't have been a sin at all. You say, why? Because Adam and Eve, bless my soul, were brother and sister. Folks just don't think about that. They had the same father, right? Then they're brother and sister. And that's why a man's wife is called his sister. Turn to the Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon. A man's wife is called his sister. Song of Solomon, chapter 5. There's a passage in uh, in uh, First Peter, it's a really good passage, that says that when talking about husbands and wives getting along, it says, be pitiful and courteous as brethren. And that's said to a guy and his wife. That thing began, likewise ye wives, be in subjection to your own husband, if any be without the word, then may be without the word, one with the conversation of their wives. Father, behold, your chaste conversation coupled with fear, who is adorning, let it not be thou adorning, wearing us, so forth and so on, the hidden man of the heart even the meek of a quiet spirit, so forth down there. And Sarah called him Lord, uh, whose daughters you are, so forth and so on. Be pitiful, courteous as brethren, and aim at a man his wife. Now, that had me kind of, you know, bothered for a while until I began to observe the way Christians treat each other. And that occurred to me that some guys treat their sisters in Christ better than they treat their wives. And some women treat their brothers in Christ better than they treat their husbands. So it occurs that if you fellows that are married could remember that your wife is not just your wife, but your sister in Christ, it affects your behavior. That's good. You think about that. <laughs> All right, Song of Solomon 5, 1. I am going to come into my garden, my sister, my spouse. Chapter 4, verse 12. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse. Your spouse, your wife. She says, he says, my sister, my spouse. So if Cain had married a sister, it would have been all right. That's probably the answer to your question. But depending upon the time element, it could have been, it could have been anybody of several hundred. All right, something else. How did you come about your study on marriage and divorce, and is marriage not holy and sacred as we were brought up to believe that it was? All right, uh, Hebrews chapter Hebrews chapter thirteen, and marriage is uh, holy. And first uh, Hebrews chapter thirteen will state it, and First Corinthians chapter seven will state it. And uh, before I get in this, I'll get in this and run you the verse on it. Let me say uh, clearly and emphatically, I, personally, individually, I don't believe in divorce. I know the grounds for divorce, and I'll show them to you, the three of them. I've taught those three grounds of divorce for 42 years in the ministry. I've never reneged on them, never gone back on them, never repented of them, don't repent now. But I don't recommend divorce when couples come to me for counseling. I think when a man and woman stand there before a preacher and say, for better or for worse, till death do us part, I think it means for better or for worse, till death do us part. 
And if I had grounds for divorce, and I've had them, I wouldn't use them. I think the best thing for any Christian couple to do is forgive and forget and make up and go on. I'd be the only people that benefit from divorce are lawyers. That's about all. And so that's my stand on it. Uh, people say, oh, Ruckman believes in abortion, Ruckman believes in divorce, blah, 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 blah. I never divorced a woman in my life. Whoever should put away his wife and marry, I've never put a woman away. The verse couldn't be any reference to me. I never put a woman away. You ever put your wife away? I have neither. We're both in the same boat. <laughs> That's tough, isn't it? I tell them, you know, I tell a Christian couple, I tell them, forgive, forget, put on the blood and go on. But the problem you have in America today is the rules are so set up that any time anybody wants to dump you, they can just dump you and walk out the door. And the fact that you intend to be true to death until death do us part means nothing to the other party. That's what you've got. The divorce rate in America now is one out of two. One out of two. Among the Christians, it's about one out of five. You take in Camp Chautauqua, I used to preach that years ago. I preach sometime many of eight or nine hundred young people. And I've been in Camp Chautauqua preaching to all the young people of the fellowship churches in Michigan, Ohio, and Indiana. Those three states. And I've gotten up there with 800 kids in there and said, how many of you kids come from a home where one or both parents have been married before? And a third of the kids stood up. And those were from the best independent Baptist churches in America. One third in 1968. Now you can imagine the condition things are in now. All right, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So their sex outside of marriage is forbidden. forbidden. And when he says marriage is honorable in all, it's, it's all right to get married. It's honorable. A little bit later in 1 Corinthians, he says, if you marry, you have not sinned. It's honorable. Now when he says the bed undefiled, the reason for that is in the Old Testament, the bed was defiled. And, uh, I don't know how much you read your Old Testament, but when Moses was in the mount and God was about to come down the mount, you know what the Lord told Moses to tell the people? Don't come at your wives. I'm coming down the third day. And those folks were legitimately married. Remember when David came to the tabernacle and got the showbread from the Barathar the priest? He said, uh, it's all right to take uh, if women have been kept from you these three days. And he says, well, we haven't had any women three days. Okay, go ahead and eat the bread. Boy, you get back in Leviticus, you married couples, and read the instruction of marriage. You find yourself taking a bath every other night, man, and every other week. I mean, over and over again, that unclean to leaving, unclean to leaving, unclean to leaving. If a man does this, unclean to leaving. If the seed, unclean to leaving, un it's defiled. In the New Testament, the marriage bed is undefiled. It's clean. One place in 1 Corinthians says, uh, else were your children unholy, but now they are clean. All right, on 1 Corinthians chapter 7, here's the, here are the rules. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the first rule is this. The first rule is in uh, verse uh, 2. To avoid fornication, get married. That's the first one. And uh, the idea of the thing about the thing is, verse 9 the reason why it's best to get married is because you're burning lust if you don't. So it's better to get married than to burn in lust. Verse 9. All right, the next thing about it is it'd be better if you could stay single. Verse 8. Verse 8. If you could stay single, it'd be better. Verse 8. If you can't, then get married. Verse 9. All right, here's the next rule. The next rule is verse 11 and verse 4. Or verse 3 and verse 4. In verse 3 and verse 4, if you're married, you ladies, your body belongs to your husband. And if you're a man, your body belongs to your wife. Tell that to a bunch of these libbers. <laughs> I mean, talk about abortion and stuff. The man there is involved in that thing. In case of a married woman, the man would make the decision. Their doctors uh, say well, Ruckman is for abortion, blah, blah, blah. No, I never recommend abortion to anybody. But I, have, I know of at least four good Christian friends of mine who had the doctor come to them and say, look here, you can choose between the baby and your wife. Your wife has another baby. She's dead. Now, what's the man going to do? Well, he better choose his wife. 
because she's the, she's the bearer of life. Moses said, if you go along there and you find a mama bird and a baby bird in the ground, you can take the baby bird, but you've got to let the mama bird go. You say, why is that? She's the life bearer. You protect the, the mother, not the child. No, oh, tell that to some of you fundamentalists. Woo-hoo, see. Now, we all know what abortion is. It's the way teenage girls get rid of the kids they don't want. We understand that. But when you start saying it's this and that, you've got to be careful what you say. Down there in, in Pensacola, we got some people down there that think abortion is murder. A lot of fundamentalists believe that. Uh, I don't. But I've had one of my fellows write an article for my uh, paper where he said it's murder, and one of my graduates, he don't agree with me, I printed his article. Because I think he's honest. Because he's in favor of killing the doctor. <laughs> now, if you believe abortion is murder, and so I me, mean, if you do, it's okay with me, I'm not going to argue, then you believe the doctor should be killed. Now, don't tell me that you believe it's murder, but you don't believe a murder should be killed, and you believe this book. This book says you'll take no satisfaction for the life of a murderer. He shall surely be put to death. Says it four times. See, some of the fundamentalists, they won't carry the thing all the way. It's murder, but, yeah, well, but what? You want to kill the doctor? You want to hold the mother and accessory after the fact? Kill her, too? You know, we had down Pensacola about a month ago. We had a guy who really consistent. <laughs> he said, Doctor, you're a killer. I'm going to blow your brains out. And he blew them out. <laughs> the doctor asked me, what do you think about that? I said, I don't think anything. I don't think you killed any more babies. He won't kill any more doctors. That's all I know. Well, if you believe that's the way it is, if, if it is murder, that guy got what he had coming to him. And he blew his brains out, man. Oh, now, the way this thing works is, you're, if you're, you ladies need to consider this before you get married, if any of you are unmarried. When you get married, your husband, your wife, your body, your body belongs to your husband. See this. What do you look at me that way for? Read your Bible. Will you? Look, at verse, look at verse 4. The wife hath not power of her own body but the husband. And likewise, the husband hath not power of his own body but the wife. You belong to each other. She belonged to you, you belong to her, your body is her property. That's it. And her body is your property. That's it. Someone said, well, I wouldn't stand with them, don't get married. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. You know, we had a fellow one time come to our church named Jacob Chili. And Jacob Chili is just black as ace of spades. I mean, he's just black as shoe leather, man. And he's a native Hindu from India and got saved. And Jacob Chile has a King James Bible over there, church in India, and you can't join his church unless you sign a sheet of paper saying the King James Bible is the one infallible inspired word of God. He's rougher than I am. I don't demand my people do that, but Jacob does. And Jacob Chile came over one time in a missionary conference, and I took him to a, a fellowship, and I had about four women and him in a, in a Volkswagen bus, and we were driving down there talking about this and that other. And the ladies kept asking Jacob about marriage and love over in India and all this stuff. And Jacob was real quiet, so he didn't speak much. Orientals are like that. And I know Orientals. I know them, man, do I ever know them, man. I've had to fight with them in training and cuss with them and swim with them and out there in Tokyo. I've been placed in Tokyo with, with an SP and MP within 10 miles in direction, 2 o'clock in the morning, man, only white man around. And I know them. I know them. And you gotta, you gotta be, you gotta be careful what you say around those birds. Those birds think, boy. They think. When they're, where they got their mouth shut, they're thinking. They're not dumb. Well, we go along here in the car, and these ladies say, what about this uh, over in India? And Jacob says, well, he says, over in India, when the woman wakes up in the morning, the first thing she has to do is kiss her husband's feet. <laughs> and I heard a couple of the women back go, oh, oh, kiss feet. Oh, I never kiss his feet. Oh, you know, American women, you know. And Jacob didn't say nothing. <laughs> And he said, uh, over in India, you must call, you call your husband Lord. And her mother, he said, call him Lord, call Jim Lord. I wouldn't call Jim Lord. Blah, 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 blah. The way they go, you know. And I'm driving the car, and I think, oh, brother, boy, it's going to drop here in a minute, man. I mean, I've seen these things before, man. The Japanese, I've seen it. But I just keep my mouth shut, and they go, oh, man. And they keep on talking, and Jacob's talking. Jacob says, oh, 
His over in India, he said the mother and father arrange the marriage when they are still children. Oh, I never heard of that. Well, I wouldn't marry a man if I didn't love him. My mom and dad, you know, away they went again, you know. And then after I got kind of quiet, I thought to myself, here comes the bomb, boy. And Jacob says, uh, how many divorces do you have in America? And that time the rate was about one out of four. And Jacob says, in India, we have one out of 50. And then Jacob says, love is not something you fall into, it's something you work at. Mm -hmm. That's where those people are. I remember one time in the, in the in, I, was a, I was what they call a music officer for Radio Tokyo, J-O-A-K, in the Army Occupation, World War II. I walked right by Mark MacArthur every morning on the Daiichi building around the Iraqa Hotel and saw the guards salute him. And in the Empress Palace there, they had all the Air Corps men meet for a big rally together. And the Japanese airmen, American airmen, got together, had a big banquet there, you know, the, about a year after the war was over and traded, you know, M Monday morning football, that kind of thing, trading notes. And that conversation got going on that table. And finally, one American turned to a Japanese and he said, for some we American can't understand, through the interpreter. The Japanese said, what's that? And the American said, why do you take some of your best men, these kamikaze divers, and throw them away and let them waste their lives on a fight that's absolutely useless? So when you attack these cruisers and things out there, you didn't sink more than a half a dozen of us, and you lost 30 or 40 or 5 of these men. Why would you throw away your lives like that in an unnecessary operation like that? It was kind of quiet for a minute, and the interpreter talked, and that Japanese colonel thought a minute, and then he talked to the interpreter, and this is what he said to the American. He said, well, he said, there's something about you Americans that we've always thought very peculiar. <laughs> and the American said, what's that? And the colonel says, we you people talk so much about loving your country enough to die for it, when you find somebody that loves our country that, uh, that, that much, why do you think it's strange? Yeah. Wham! They'll land on you. All right, First Corinthians 7, here's the next rule. Verse 10, Under the married I command, yet not I but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. She's not to go. Now there can be a temporary separation, but if she depart, let her remain unmarried to be reconciled to her husband. Now she can't desert. It has to be mutual. Look at verse 5. Defraud ye not one another except it be with consent. That is, the husband has to agree to a temporary separation or the wife to a temporary separation. And those temporary separations, they're to come together again. They can't get married again. They come together again. And there has to be an agreement. Then he says in verse 12, if a, if a saved man has an unsaved wife, she wants to stay with him, let them stay together. 13, if a saved woman has an unsaved husband, let them stay together. Why is that? Verse 14, the marriage bed is undefiled because of the saved person. So the children are clean because of the saved person. doesn't say the saved. Now verse 15, if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother, that's a saved person, or a sister, that's a saved woman, is not under bondage in such cases. You're not bound to the deserting party. They go, let them go. God calls us to peace. Now he makes no arraignment there for a saved woman leaving a saved man or a saved man leaving a saved woman. The reason why it doesn't is taken for granted that if you're a saved woman or a saved man, you'll obey God. Now to show you how much that how much he takes that for granted in this passage. Look on down here on the single women. Verse 34, there's a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman care for the things of the Lord. She may be holy both in body and spirit. Is that true of every, un is that true of every saved Christian single girl? Why, of course it's not. You know a lot of saved Christian girls that care only, that don't care just for the things of the Lord and are trying to be holy in body and spirit. He's taken for granted if you're saved, you'll, you'll live right. And the same may with a man. Look at verse, uh, in the same passage, look at verse uh, 33, or verse 32. He that is unmarried care for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please God. Why, you know some unmarried young men that don't care for the things of the Lord? Sure you do. So he's taken for granted. Now in the case where you have a saved person leaving a saved person, they violated the scripture. Let not, well, let not the wife depart, and if she departs without mutual consent, that's fraud. 
defraud not one another. And the question comes up, what about the bondage? Well, the answer to that thing is, in Matthew chapter 16 and 18, if you have a controversy with a brother, you go to him alone, the two of you and, you and him talk. Then if he doesn't listen, you take two witnesses and go talk. Then if that doesn't work, you take it to the church. Then if that doesn't work, let him be as a heathen man and a publican, an unsaved person, a heathen. So in a case like that between man and woman, your job will take a man's case. Your job, first of all, is to well, take a woman's case. Uh, you ladies have trouble with a man. You say man, and you want to leave him, and you go to him, and you say this and that and so forth and so on. Maybe he's stepping out on you and try to get things right with him, and you can't get things right with him. All right, your job then is to call the pastor in for pastoral counseling with another witness and talk to him about the problem. And if he doesn't hear them, then you tell the church. And if the church, he doesn't hear the church and get right, then let him be the heathen man and the publican. Well, the thing works is if it goes through, through that and the person doesn't get right, then taking the law is legitimate. You're not to take a brother or sister to law, say a person in the first Corinthians five and six. But in this case here where the person refused to hear you and the witness and the church, then you treat him as like an unsaved man or a woman. Oh, right, now let's come on down a little bit further on the, on the calling. Uh, verse uh, 27. Art thou bound to a wife? Aren't you bound to a wife? How many of you fellows are bound to a wife? Let me see your hands. Okay, here's your instruction. Seek not to be loosed. That's your instruction. All right. Second, art thou loosed, my wife? You were married, now you're not married? Here's your instruction. Seek not a wife. Stay single. But, keep reading. But, and if thou marry, suppose you do seek a wife. Underline it. Thou hast not sinned, no matter what the brethren think or say. They can flip their lid and it won't make any difference. You have not sinned. And if a virgin marry, somebody's never been married before, she had not sinned. Nevertheless, problem, such will have trouble in the flesh. But I spare you. All right, the thing there was, if you lose my wife, you're, you're caution, first of all, stay single. But if you do get a wife, you haven't sinned but two things. Number one, you have to marry another Christian. Verse 39, married to whom she will, only in the Lord. And number two, you're going to have trouble in the flesh. Now, let's turn to Romans chapter, I'll wind this thing up, 1 Corinthians 6 and Romans chapter 7, the pastors, and show you where modern fundamentalists have got their Bible all screwed up. And it's due to a sex emphasis. Of the, it's sex o'clock in America. And everybody's hung up on abortion and marriage and divorce and abortion and marriage and divorce and shorts and abortion and marriage and divorce and all that stuff. The whole sex problem, the sex crazy, nuts on it. And the idea is uh, it's an unpardonable sin to commit a sin that I don't commit. That's the idea. I had a meeting one time in, uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, and a fellow from, uh, from uh, Southern Bible Institute or South, Mid-South, Mid-South Bible Institute, phoned this pastor up on the phone before I came to the meeting, and he said, uh, I hear you have Ruckman in for a meeting. The fellow said, that's right. And he said, I didn't know you had adulterers in your pulpit. And this pastor said, oh, yeah, sure, we have them all the time. <laughs> and this guy, this guy at Mid-South said, why, I'm shocked, Brother So-and-so. I didn't think you'd do a thing like that. I said, sure, yeah, we do, we do. As a matter of fact, I'm an adulterer myself. And the guy said, you are? And he said, yes. And he said, well, I didn't know that you'd been married more than once. And he said, I haven't been married more than once. I've been married once. But he said, the Bible said, whoever looks upon a woman to lust after in his heart hath already committed adultery with her. Amen. Click, down goes that phone. Amen. See? Amen. You've got a Pharisee over there, boy. That's right. He didn't read all of his Bible. He just read part of it. Yeah. And he figured if this fellow does something I wouldn't do, he's a bad cat. But if he does what I do, he's all right. I remember one time, uh, my, my wife, in unsaved days, married before I was saved, she left me, and she left me, Bob Jones up there, and Junior, he was up in, in Greenville, and he wanted to get all the property around our church for his buddy Horton. Uh, Arlen Horton graduated from Bob Jones, and he was trying to get our church property for his school, and he couldn't get it as long as I was there, because I was paying the bills. I was paying the bills for a graduate of Tennessee Temple named Dolphus Price. 
And uh, he left about $500,000 worth of bad bills there. And I told those people, I'll sit here and pay for the church, get this thing paid off till we're all paid off, and then I'll, I'll resign. So I stayed there. As long as I was there, the bills were getting paid, the bond program was getting met, and they couldn't get the property. So Alan Horton went to Bob Jones Jr. and said, well, you put a little pressure on him, get him off the land, we can get this piece of land. So Bob Jones Jr. wrote me a letter, and he said, uh, what are you doing pastoring down there? You don't qualify for a pastor. The Bible said a pastor be the husband of one wife, and you're single. You've got to be the husband of one wife to be a, a pastor, and you're single. I wrote back and said, okay, since I'm single, I'll get married, and then I'll qualify by being the husband of one wife. He wrote back and said, no, then you'd have two. <laughs> I wrote back and I said, you're the first college president I've met in my life that thought zero and one was two. <laughs> you know, some folks can't even count on their fingers, you know that? I mean, the guy said, you're single, but if you get married, you got two? Ain't that weird? I was out in a meeting one time in California, and, and, and I was at a table there, about 16 pastors and their wives, and suddenly kind of a hush fell across the table, you know. You tell the bomb was about to drop. And uh, right across me, the pastor across me says, uh, Doctor, I'm going to ask you a question. You think a divorced man should preach? And I said, uh, uh, what would you say? You know, I heard him the first time, but you, when they do that, you want to pray and ask God to give you something to say. You need a little time there, so you stall. So, yeah. I said, well, give me something to drum this for. What would you say? And uh, he said, do you think a divorced man should preach? And I said, well, look at it this way. I said, uh, suppose you and your wife aren't getting along. Boy, if the Lord didn't give me something, man. I remember when I said that, his wife dropped her head, and he turned beet red in the face. And you never know what you're getting into, you know. <laughs> I, said, I said, suppose your wife and you aren't getting along. One day she just gets up and leaves you. You going to keep on preaching? He said, well, I hadn't thought about it. I said, well, did God call you to preach? He said, yes. I said, God called your wife to preach? He said, no. I said, you couldn't quit just because she quit, could you? Could you let her control your ministry? If God called you to preach, could you go back on God just because she went back on God? He said, well, I never thought about that. I said, well, think about it. Please pass the salt. <laughs> that was the end of that. <laughs> All right, now get Revelation, get Romans chapter 7 in one hand. I'll show what these fellows did. Now, I'm going to read this thing. Now, you understand I'm not advocating multiple marriages. I don't believe in them. And the Lord put me through what he put me through against my will. I resent it. <laughs> I always have. If I'd done it, if I'd been done it my way, I wouldn't have done the way it was done at all. But the Lord gave it. You're not going to tell what God what to do. He's just going to do what He's going to do. You can't stop Him. He's just going to do it. And I know why the Lord did what He did. I know why He did it to make you Christians that believe that book get made fun of and ridiculed for standing by that book because it'd be associated with a rascal. That's why He did it. Lord put me through what He put me through. So if you take a stand in that book, you'll look bad. Because you'll be lined up with me. <laughs> and who wants to be lined up with a ruckman, you know? That's what the Lord did. I mean, he had to do something to get you Christians to go take some persecution. You're not getting jailed, getting shot at, getting in prison. you got to do something to try your mettle. So he thought he'd put a test of ridicule on you and see how you could take it. I'm just, I'm the patsy man. I'm the fall guy. I don't, I don't got nothing to do with it. I just kick around like a balloon, man. It's a... Uh, it's like uh, it's like this. Uh, a fellow can be brave and bold enough to stand against the Catholic Church and assassination of the government and the mafia, and be so afraid of ridicule he'd rather go to hell and be made fun of. That's right. Amen. Now I'll show you an example. Here's Eon Paisley. Eon Paisley is a fire eater. He took on the British Broadcasting System, CBS, Lifetime, Newsweek, and Europe, and the Roman Catholic Church. He got up in the French Parliament and held up a sign calling the Pope an Antichrist and got run out of the Parliament. That old boy's got guts. He's in North Island, Presbyterian North Island. He's a fireier, he on Paisley. Well, one day, Larry Bartlett and Bill Bartlett were over there in, uh, in Metropolitan Tabernacle going through it with Eon Paisley, Spurgeon's old church. And Larry Bartlett turns to Eon Paisley and said, uh, do you, uh, you, do you ever, you know, a Ruckman? He said, oh yeah, I know Peter Ruckman. He said, do you ever read any of his books? He said, I've read his books. And Bartlett says, well, what do you think about his position in the King James Bible? And Paley said, well, he's absolutely right. But don't tell Dr. Bob I said that. <laughs> Isn't that a strange thing? 
Here's a fellow who can stand the Irish Republican Army and Europe and the wrath of the American press, and he doesn't want Bob Jones to know that he believes what Ruckman believes about the Bible. Got a little problem there, soldier. Got a little problem there, boy. Not much guts there as you thought you had. He said it was the problem. At that time, he had a daughter going to Bob Jones University. Now, see what the Lord going to do to you? He's going to put you in a place where if you believe that book, you're going to get associated with me, and then you'll hear every bad thing about Ruckman bought up to prove that you're just like Ruckman. And they'll call you Ruckmanites. <laughs> and the Lord does that to, te to test and see if you've got any guts or any backbone. And if you don't, you're chicken out. That never bothered me. Uh, people come around to me and say, you're carrying the torch for Bob Jones Sr. I say, he's a good man to carry the torch for you don't bother me any. I don't. My loyalties uh, are never divided. I'll stick by a gate. In fact, if he's running me off, if I think the guy is all right, I'll stand up for him after he's dumped me off. People don't have that much impression. People don't have that much influence on me. Any of them. They just don't influence me. If I was sticking up for a guy, I'd stick up for him no matter what. Hiles got that mess he got into. I've never been a close friend of Hiles. He never invited me in for a meeting. When he got in that mess and the scum just started writing all this stuff, I said, don't worry about it. He did more for God in a year than you do in ten. Goodbye. <laughs> Nothing to me. The guy don't have to be my friend if he to stick up for him. If I stick up for a guy, I'll stick up for a guy no matter what he's doing. Nothing to me. But boy, some of the brethren do have a time with it. 7-1. <laughs> now I'm going to read this like Sammy Allen and Harold Seidler and all the boys read it. And then I'm going to read it like it says. Now first we're going to read it like Sam Allen, a Roman Catholic priest, would read it. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. Well, that's a funny thing to put in there. The fellows who are teaching this passage don't know the law. You know what the law says in Deuteronomy 24? It says if a guy gives his wife a developed divorce and puts it away, she can go meet another man's wife. And the second marriage was so binding that if that fellow dies, she can't go back to her first husband. But the brethren don't know about that, because they don't know the law. Yeah. Hath dominion over a man as long as he lives, for the woman which hath a husband is bound with the law to the man she married as long as he lives. But if the man she was married to is dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if while the man she was married to liveth, and she be married to another man, she should be called an adulteress. But if husband be a dead, she is free from the law, so she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now they're in that thing so that this woman gets a divorce from this fella. If she gets a divorce from this fella and marries another fella while he's still alive, she's an adulteress. Now they look at verse 1, 2, and 3 and tell me where you find a divorce. Look at it, 1, 2, and 3. Where is the bill of divorcement? It isn't there. You know, they took for granted, they took for granted and said that she'd be married to another man, she had to get a divorce before she married the guy. You know why they took that for granted? Because they thought the divorce was the paper and the marriage was the license. All right, keep your hand right there and we'll back to it in a minute and come to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and let's see what a marriage is. Ladies and gentlemen, you could be married without a ring or a license, or a piece of paper. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm not advocating common law marriage. I'm telling you the essence of a marriage is where flesh joins flesh. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to a heart is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. Now, do you see that quotation in 16? You know where that's from? You got a cross-reference on it? Genesis. Genesis 2. You know what that's a reference to? The first marriage. And Christ said, He that made him at the beginning, Adam and Eve, made the man and wife, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and cleave to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. It's a marriage. Except it's a harlot. And when the guy joined his body to that harlot, they became one flesh. So some of these proud, self-righteous ministerial brethren, they got them a lesson they better learn before they hit the judgment seat of Christ. 
I mean, Ruckman, here you got uh, three wives, no, more like about 22, I think, 25, something like that. I forget the count. And you got people around right here, might be 50. Amen. They think they're clean because nobody caught them. That's right. Amen. Oh, goodbye, baby, on the freedom. <laughs> Oh, now back to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Didn't you ever wonder why he said, whoever put away his wife except for fornication? Why do you say fornication? Because you and your wife are like that. You're one flesh. But flee fornication. Every sin that a man does without the body, he commits fornication, sins against his own body. What? You know you're not sure members of the body of Christ? Like take the members of Christ, join the heart? That thing? Now, if your husband left you, and shacked up with another woman, they're one flesh, you're single. Doesn't like this. Your wife stepped out on you, joined her by another man. That's why fornication is the ground of divorce. Because they're already divorced. Now the problem comes back, what are you going to do where he goes over here and comes back here? <laughs> and goes over here and comes back here. Or she goes over here, comes back here, goes over. That's polygamy. She's got two husbands, or you've got two wives. Christ says, that woman there in John chapter 4, go call your husband. She said, I got a husband. He said, you told right, right. You had five of them. The guy is shacking up with right now is not your husband. He's another woman's husband. <laughs> the woman's a polygamist. She's got multiple husbands. That's why the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, the bishop is to be the husband of one wife. It didn't say married. It said husband of one wife. Not married one time, the husband of one wife. I got the graduate of Tennessee Temple one time. He and I were going around about this, and he said, Ruck, you don't qualify for the ministry because you've been married more than once. So what's that got to do with anything? He said, well, First Timothy chapter 3 says he's to be the husband of one wife. I said, yeah, but that means the husband of one wife. It doesn't mean just married. He said, well, no, I believe he's married. I said, no, you don't believe that. He said, yes, I do. I said, no, you don't. He said, you call me a lie? I said, yeah, matter of fact, I am. We'll show it to you in a minute. I said, are you telling me that if a man has been married more than once, he shouldn't be in the ministry? And the fellow said, yes. I said, okay, Bob Jones Sr. has been married twice. Talmadge is married three times. Adoniram Judson married three times. Monk Parker is married three times. You tell me his fellows don't belong in the ministry? Oh, he said, yeah, but their wives died. I said, hey, boy, too late to back out now. You said it meant married once. Don't flip out now. And say it meant married once, unless it means just what it says. It means your pastor is to have one woman instead of two or three women. And if you if you ever fix that thing, it means married once. You know what I mean? It means as long as your pastor had a wedding ring in his finger and one marriage license, then he can have as many women as he wanted to. I'm suspicious some of these brethren that take that interpretation. Amen. Makes me nervous. Makes me nervous. <laughs> He's to be true to the wife he has. All right, now 7-2. Now watch this thing. The woman which hath a husband, present tense, got one right now, see that? Is bound with the law to her husband so long as he lives. Who? The guy she's married to. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. All right, she can get married again if he dies. So then if while her husband liveth, that's the guy she's married to, not somebody else. She might be married to another man. She should be called what? An adulteress. She joined her body to the body of another man. But like this, and she took her body and joined this fellow. She's an adulteress. Why? She stepped out on her husband. Why do you say marry? Because when flesh joins flesh, that's a marriage. And there's no divorce there. That woman stepped out on her husband. And when she stepped on, she called an adulteress, she committed adultery. What is it called? It's called a marriage. <coughs> but if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now, if you don't take that interpretation, you get into the biggest mess you ever saw. I mean, I have known preacher that insist on this thing, and I said to one preacher one time, I said, do you mean to tell me if a woman married a guy, and then he left her and went off and stepped out, and she divorced him, and he went off here and married another woman, and she married another man, that she should leave the fellow she's with and go back and marry the first guy that she dumped? He said, yes. <laughs> I said, are you telling me that woman should bust up two homes after the first one had been busted up? They're crazy. 
Art thou bound to a wife? Seek not a wife. Art thou loose from a wife? Seek not a wife. Art thou bound to a husband? Let not the wife depart from her husband. If you're one of these people that had a misfortune to go through a divorce and be remarried, the woman you have now or the man you have now, you're to stick with. You don't have to go back and dig around the past and find up the first one and mess up their home. What a dumb, stupid thing to do. I mean, there's, there's some, there's some, some people in this country now, this country get in some rough shape. There's some people in this country where a woman may have been married before she was saved when she was 16. And then the guy left her and she married again when she was 18. Then she got a dope and got divorced, got married. She was 25. And then she got saved and that fellow deserted her and she got married again. She was 30. Now what's she to do? Go back and find that guy that left her when she was 16 and marry him? No. Dumb, stupid stuff. She has three living husbands. She has four living husbands. She, she has three living No, she doesn't. The guy she's joined to is her husband. That's right. And she's not to depart from him. And the woman you're joined to is your wife, and you're not to seek to be loose. The problem I had when I first got saved was real simple. I was married to a woman I didn't love and uh, admired for expediency. And being an unsafe fellow, I didn't have any sense. I was just a dumb fool. And uh, coming up, I got to be about 21 years old, and the war broke out, 1943. Uh, found me thinking about getting married. I got married in 1944. And my thinking, I'll tell you, I mean, I'm saved now. I don't think like I used to think, but I thought about this way. I thought, well, my MOS is a combat platoon leader. Now, how long does a combat platoon leader have when the action starts? Well, it's about <laughs> two and a half minutes, something like that. Now, I didn't have any illusions about the infantry. I was raised in a military home. Dad was a colonel, granddad was a general, brother was a sergeant, I was a lieutenant. I knew what was going to come off. And I said to myself, I'm going to go overseas and get killed. I mean, fighting Germans, that, it ain't funny, McGee, it ain't funny. <laughs> and I said, I might as well have a little life before I go, so I'll just pick me a good, rich girl with plenty of money and, you know, a good looker and... Have a little married life before I go. So I figured, more the Lord, Lord, if He can't make a fool out of you, boy, if the Lord can't mess you up, I figured I'm not coming back anyway. I miscalculated. I got back. <laughs> so I married this girl. She had money, and she's a good-looking girl. Married a girl. She's a clean girl. She didn't drink, didn't smoke, didn't dance, didn't go to the movies. And any old dog off the street has no sense to pick a clean woman to come time to get married, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but she, she never professed Christ, she never read a Bible, never went to church. Later on, she professed to be a Christian. Well, I went overseas and lived like the devil for years and came back. And I came back, went back to drinking, the family busted up. And one day I called her in and sat down and talked with her and just told her the whole thing. And I said, it's no good, it ain't gonna work. I said, you go back to mama. I'll go off down here in Pensacola, let's just forget the whole mess. And I went off down in Pensacola and she went back to mama on the farm. Family broke up. And they went back here, and her and mother got praying. And what happened was they got saved. And as soon as they got saved, the men led me to Christ. His name was Hugh Pyle. And Hugh Pyle uh, said, now the first thing to do is get this guy's family back together again. Naturally, that's what a preacher would think. So he got us together and counseled with us and had prayer with us. And I was willing to make things right. And she was too, but she wasn't very much upset about it, pretty hard about it. Of course, you couldn't blame her. And went through that thing, and we were out praying, and we went up to Dixon Mills and got baptized, and then right then the trouble started. The first thing wrong was, you went down the water without me. We could have been baptized together. The second thing was, what are you doing looking at that girl at the altar? The third thing was, why do you like her singing and don't like mine? The next thing was, uh, if you don't get out of the ministry, I'm going to kill myself. The next thing was, raise her on the wrist. The next thing is, you're driving in a car 50 miles an hour at night. She starts to go out the door, and you have to grab her from going out the door in the middle of the night. Next thing you get off to a meeting someplace, you get your wedding ring mailed back during the meeting, you know. That's, that really revive you, man. You're out in the middle of a revival meeting, your wedding ring coming back in an envelope. What a joy divine, you know. And going through this stuff, and I'm going through this stuff, and I look at the Bible, and the Bible says, Art thou bound to a wife? Seek not to be loose. I'm going to obey God. I'm going to stick it out. I know it's not going to work. It couldn't possibly work. But those are the orders. And an order is an order. So I obeyed the order. And then finally it came to a head. And one day, if you don't have the minister, I'm going to kill myself. If you don't have the minister, I'm divorced. And then one day off she goes. Boy takes the car back to mama. 
An old ruckman left there in an empty house, five kids gone, the wife and the car, and sitting there with a German shepherd and no ministry. I've had some days, brother, had some days. But that book says, don't seek to be loosed. I didn't seek to be loosed. That book was everywhere put away his wife except for fornication. I've never put away a woman even when she was guilty of fornication. I don't believe in divorce. I think, uh, how many of you have been married more than 30 years? Let me see your hands. Well, good. That's good. Everybody married more than 40? A couple of you. I think that's great. I like to see them golden anniversaries. 50 years. That's great. And one of those guys ought to get the Congressional Medal of Honor. <laughs> and if I had my way, it'd all be like that. But folks, you're living in a country. It ain't going to come out that way. Uh, some of the most bitter critics, you know, Ruckman this and Ruckman that. You know what happened to them in less than one year after they opened the big mouth? Their children got divorced. That's happened a dozen times. Jack Hiles, John Rollins, Bob Jones Jr. Slam, slam. You better watch your mouth. I'll give you one illustration. I'll close here. I got a telephone call from a preacher one time about three years ago. Well, maybe about five years ago. He's up here someplace. And he said, uh, I got a problem, Brother Ruckman. I said, what is it? My wife left me. And I said, well, uh, she go back to Mama. <clears throat> she went back to Mama. Have any children? Yeah, I took two children with her. I said, well, what were you doing? He said, I was pastor in a church up here. I said, what have you done now? He said, I resigned. And I said, are you preaching? He said, no. I said, what's your problem? He said, well, Brother Ruckman, I said, I've been out of the ministry now about two months. And he said, every time I go to church on a Sunday and look up there in the pulpit, I keep thinking I'm supposed to be up there preaching. He said, I don't know what to do. And I said, well, uh, you left your church two months ago. He said, that's right. I said, how long has your wife been gone? He said, about five months. I said, when your wife left, what did your people do? He said, not much. I said, they, did they know your wife? He said, yeah, they knew her. I said, what did they think when she left? He said, they didn't think anything. I said, they take your side? He said, yeah, they took my side. I said, why didn't you stay? Your people backed you up. Why didn't you stay? And he said, well, I, I couldn't. I said, why couldn't you? He said, well, I phoned up Brother Hiles and asked Brother Hiles my position. He said, no, if your wife left you, you no longer qualify for the ministry. You'll have to quit. I said, phone Brother Hiles up and tell him he doesn't know what the cotton-picking world he's talking about. You should have stayed with your people. Now, Brother Hiles has made some progress in the last five or six years of the King James. I don't know how much progress he's made on counseling people. But the thing that young men are up against these days is they're dealing with these hyper-super-spiritual guys that know nothing about life. That's the problem. And it's all very well for this preacher to tell you to do this and that and so forth and so on, but has he ever dug a ditch? Has he ever moved rocks? He ever split kindling? Ever clean out a grease trap? Ever clean out an empty commode? <laughs> empty a commode? He ever change light bulbs? Did he ever grow a garden? Did he ever oh, get out in the world? Did he ever does he know anything at all about drunks and dopers and prostitutes and junkies and whoremongers and pimps? What, what does he know about life? And they're giving advice that's bad advice. Bad advice. In Las Vegas, you can get a divorce or married on a slot machine. They got things you put your money in and pull the thing out, and out comes the marriage form. You and her sign it, and then send it into the town hall and comes back, you're married. Then you want a divorce, you go and put 50 cents in, <laughs> pull the thing out, out come the form, write it out, me up the lawyer, bill for $250, you're gone. I preached out in Las Vegas in churches where you come to church, there'll be eight families in there who've been married to each other with, with, with eight sets of children. The wildest thing you've ever seen in your life, man. I don't even know how they do it. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. How are you? <laughs> how are the kids? Just fine, thank you. My God, people. I'm mean, This country is so far gone, there's no way to pick up anything. Boy, it's just gone. And um, I wouldn't advise you, and different I'd advise anybody. Uh, if, you're, if you're saved, your husband's saved, he'd been stepping out on you, I'd put him on the spot about it. And I would deal with him about it, and if he didn't straighten out, I'd call the preacher in on it. And if that didn't work, I'd tell him I believe in toughing things out and being true to the end, and I'm going to be praying for you. I'd get the whole church praying for the guy. Until God killed him, or got him right. 
And I've seen that happen. But I wouldn't fool with a I wouldn't fool with a divorce. I don't believe in it. Okay, does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> yeah, all right, brother. About four thirty, maybe better quit along here. Thanks, preacher. I told you you're gonna get